National League for Democracy, and she began to tour the country to promote the cause of democracy and freedom. In 1989, she was prohibited by the junta from standing for election and then placed under house arrest without either charge or trial. In 1991, she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Her sons, Alexander and Kim, accepted the prize on her behalf because she had rejected the offer of the junta to be freed if she would leave Burma and withdraw from politics. Characteristically, she used the prize money to establish a health and education trust for the Burmese people. In 1995, she was released from house arrest when she and her husband met for the last time. However, her movements were restricted and members of the League continued to be physically attacked and imprisoned. In 2002, the junta announced that she was free to move, but in 2003, during a tour of the country, her entourage was attacked and many of her supporters were killed or wounded. She escaped physical harm, but she was arrested and imprisoned and returned to house arrest. In response to international pressure in 2009, she was allowed varying degrees of freedom and she was able to meet visiting heads of state. And in November 2010, after a widely criticized general election, the junta released her. The National League for Democracy then announced its intention to register again as a party. In April 2012, she was elected to parliament, becoming the leader of the opposition in the lower house. In all those long years of isolation and oppression, she exercised courage and grace in the face of tyranny, inspiring her people through one of the darkest periods of their history with a strength and resolution of body, mind and spirit achieved at an unimaginable personal cost. Again and again around the world and here today, she is rightly honored as an extraordinary example of civil courage offered sacrificially in support of those who are striving everywhere by peaceful means to obtain democracy, human rights, and reconciliation. Mr. Chancellor, it gives me the greatest pleasure to present to you for admission to the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa of Monash University, Dorang San Suu Kyi. With the authority of council, I admit you, Do Aung San Suu Kyi, to the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa of Monash University. It is with great pleasure that I invite Do Aung San Suu Kyi to deliver the graduation address. Thank you. I would like to thank the university as well as everybody in the audience for the honor that they have conferred on me today. This is not the first honorary degree I have received, but it is one that I treasure. I will always treasure every honorary degree that is conferred on me because I have a great respect 
for learning and scholarship. We Burmese are great believers in learning. We think that knowledge is the way to enlightenment, and enlightenment is the way out of suffering. However, I do not think that it is really possible for human beings to entirely escape suffering. This is what we try to do in all walks of life in our own way. Scholars try to do it in their own way, and politicians try to do it in theirs. The subject I have chosen to speak about today is reconciliation and the rule of law. I chose reconciliation because I understand that this is a theme particularly dear to this university. And I was very struck by the way in which reconciliation is approached in this university. I have here a quotation. We accept that communication is inherently imperfect, unpredictable, ambiguous, and fragile, and that as a result, reconciliation can never be fully realized as a final state or outcome. Rather, it is an ongoing process that can serve many different purposes. It can continue, it can con contribute to consolidating peace, breaking a cycle of violence, restoring justice at the personal and social levels, bringing about personal healing and reparation for past injustices, or building nonviolent relationships between individuals and communities. Reconciliation is greatly needed in our country. I'm speaking about reconciliation and the rule of law, not just because I chair the Committee for Rule of Law in the legislature, but I believe that rule of law is essential to genuine national reconciliation and vice versa. National reconciliation is essential if we are truly to enjoy the fruits of rule of law. Burma is a country of many peoples, as I keep repeating. We are a nation of, officially, more than 100 ethnic nationalities. But we have not been united. Since we became independent in 1948, we have been fractured by strife, by disagreement, by lack of understanding of one another's aspirations and fears. Because of that, efforts to build a nation have often been hindered. To this day, we have not known absolute peace. Since independence, there have been outbreaks of insurgencies all over the country. Insurgencies because of different ideological beliefs, insurgencies because of different races, ethnic races. Today, there is an effort to bring about a permanent peaceful settlement, but we have still a long way to go. Without genuine reconciliation, we will not be able to achieve what we set out to achieve in 1948 when we thought that we would be the most success successful and vigorous nation in Southeast Asia. We were recognized as the nation most likely to succeed, but all these hopes were dashed by years of military authoritarianism. I'm not now going to speak about the past, but about the future. Why we think that national reconciliation and rule of law are necessary that we may be able to recover, we'll be able to recover from the wounds inflicted on us through years of dictatorship. Through years during which our people never felt the security of the protection of the law. For the great majority of people in Burma, the law is there to oppress them, to suppress them, to restrict them, to stop them from exercising their initiative and from real realizing their potential. We now have to work to make them understand that the law is there for them to protect us, to keep us in harmony, to keep us secure, to keep us free, to keep us peaceful.
fact that we are just starting out on the road to democracy and we are nowhere near where we wish to get to as yet. We can, of course, never come to the end of the road. It has to be an ongoing process, like the process of reconciliation. But we want to get to a point when we can say that we are able to leave a safe and precious legacy to generations that will follow us, and that they will continue to build the nation that our fathers dreamt of when they fought for independence before 1948. There is much violence in the world today. There is violence in my country too. I think most of you know about it. Ethnic strife, communal strife. What is at the base of this strife? It's an inability to reconcile our differences. Let, allow me to put it that simply. There are of course many, many approaches to the problems of my country. But the disability to settle differences peacefully has been the main reason for strife within my nation. We have to understand that if we want to build a secure and free country, we have to respect the security and freedom of others as much as we respect our own freedom on our own security. What will get us freedom and security? Rule of law will be a great factor. Rule of law means that we are all equal under the existing laws. I'm a little wary of using the term law by itself because you can be ruled by law rather than having enjoying the fruits of rule of law. The expression for rule of law in Burmese is much better. It translates as the rule of just laws. So this is what we wish. We wish to live under the rule of just laws applied equally to everybody in the land. Unless we all feel that we have equal access to justice, that we have ac equal access to the protection of the law, we will not be able to sort out our differences. Quite often, when we talk to our ethnic nationalities, about what it is that they are striving for. They say very simply, equality. They feel that the majority Burmese are unequal, are unequally privileged. And I think they are right, because the Burmese are the majority. We are strongest in numbers. We have been strongest in political power. And those in political power are in a position to do great wrong if they're not careful. And great wrong has been done to our ethnic nationalities. But I do not want the past to shackle us. I do not want us to be prisoners of the past. And I believe that our ethnic nationalities share this desire to break out of the prison of the past. For this, we have to learn to forgive, not to forget. I do not think that forgetting helps because we must not forget where we went wrong in the past. In this way, we can go forward to a future where we all feel safe. Reconciliation and rule of law has been the foundation of my party, the National League for Democracy. When it was founded in 1988, we said we would work for democracy, for human rights, and for national reconciliation, because these three are all linked. Without de democratic values, without the protection of human rights, and without national reconciliation, we could not become a strong and peaceful and stable nation. When we contested the by-elections last year, one of the major plat planks of our election platform was rule of law. Rule of law, an end to ethnic conflict, and amendments to the Constitution. Again, these are all linked. And these, of course, are linked to the basic principles of our party, democracy, human rights, and national reconciliation. 
We need rule of law in order that we may progress, not just politically and socially, but economically. There is great interest in Burma today as the golden hope for the future. This is the place where people hope there will be a happy ending, such as is rarely found these days in the world. But investment is not the answer to every problem of a nation. And even if investment is the answer, we will not be able to get the kind of economic investment that we wish for without the social and political security that those who invest would like to see. So when we talk about rule of law, we are also talking about material progress, about the conditions that will enable material progress to take place in our country. And we need material progress as we proceed along the road to democracy, because our people have to feel that democracy is better for them. They, it must be demonstrated that democracy bears good and healthy fruit. So a, a main element of the road to democracy that we must walk is the rule of law. Amendments to the Constitution are linked to this because the Constitution is the greatest and most fundamental law of the land. And unless it is just and seen to be just, by our people, we will not be able to make them understand the importance of rule of law. The Constitution, as it is, is not acceptable to our ethnic nationalities. And so, apart from militating against the rule of law, it militates against national reconciliation. A Constitution has to be acceptable to the vast majority of the people of the land. They all have to feel that it is there to protect them and to make sure that they are the equal of everybody else in the land. I mentioned earlier the importance that our peoples put on equality. When we were campaigning for the by-elections last year, I found that the most effective way of making our people understand why they have a responsibility to vote, was simply to explain to them that on that one day, the day of voting, they would be the equal of the president himself. He had one vote, each of them had one vote. And that they must use this vote and use it in a way which they think best. The sense that they were the equal of the highest in the land appealed to our people's sense of justice. And we had a turnout that I think was a record, about 70%. Can you claim that in Australia? I don't know. But I understand that in established democracies, there is less, uh, less passion about election day. We are still passionate about election day because we are still at a point where when we have yet to exercise the full rights of our citizenship. Reconciliation will help us to achieve our full rights because we will then be able to work together towards one goal. If we are divided, we will not succeed as early and as, and as painlessly as we might if we were to be united. That is why national reconciliation is essential to the cause in which my party and I have been engaged for nearly 30 years now. It astonished me sometimes to think that it is now 30 years since we started asking, calling, fighting for democracy. Then I must admit, I did not think that the road would be quite so long. Hard, yes. We accepted that it would be a hard road. But we thought that the great majority of the people of our country understood the need for a political system that would keep us all together as a true union. But it was not so. There were many 
who believed that democracy was divisive because democracy meant too many different ideas, that too much independent thinking. This is one of the reasons why I say that I find sometimes that politics is very close to scholarship, that politicians are close to universities because universities encourage free thinking. And we, as politicians who believe in democracy, encourage free thinking. When I was in Canberra, I visited the Australian National University and met some Burmese students who were studying there. And I asked them what they had learned since coming to Australia. And one of them said to ask questions that throughout his education in Burma, because he grew up under the military regime, he was never allowed to ask questions. And it was a surprise to him that questions not only could be asked, but should be asked, especially in an academic environment. I told him that the reason why he had learned only now that questions should be asked was because he had not joined our party. <laughs> We, we have always encouraged the asking of questions. This is something that we had to do uh, religiously. Our young people, we had to say to our young people, you must ask questions. And then we had to teach our people to ask a very simple, practical question. At one point in time, this was in the 1990s, uh, things were very tough. Our people were arrested on the least pretext, and suddenly they would disappear from their homes because the arrests usually were made in the middle of the night. And then we would have to look for them. The families would have to look and inquire to find out where they were, in which interrogation center, at which police station, at which prison. And we had to say to our people, now, if anybody comes to arrest you, you must ask them, do you have a warrant? This was the simple question that we had to teach our people because we had been so far removed from the rule of law that we did not think that we had the right to question why we were being arrested. So we had to say, you must ask, have you got a warrant? And there's a story attached to it which is either funny or sad, depending on how you look at it. So one member of our party who was a, a good learner when the people came to arrest him in the middle of the night, he said, have you got a warrant? And the answer was, don't be silly. We all already have decided how long we're going to sentence you for. <laughs> so that, that, that was, this was what his family told me after he'd been taken away in the night, that he had, he had listened to our instructions and asked this question and received an answer. So you who live in a free society are unaware of the many everyday challenges that we have to face. When we talk about reconciliation and the rule of law, we are not talking about theses. We are not talking about theories. We are not talking about academic exercises. We are talking about everyday life. We are talking about the right to ask why our freedom was going to be taken away from us. And we are talking about the necessity for our people to be united that we may protect our freedom. A university is the best place in the world where young people can learn the importance of freedom and learn the importance of fighting to keep their freedom. Too often, people expect others to fight for them. It is I have to confess that it is in many ways touching, but also in many ways it is a little discouraging when our people look to my party and me to do whatever is necessary for us to achieve democracy. Quite often in the, in the more difficult days, I would have people coming to me and asking, and when are we going to get democracy? In a rather of way, as though we had not been doing enough. So I would always uh, retaliate with the question, what are you doing for us to, to help us achieve democracy? 
and uh, usually there would be no answer. And then I would say, if you are doing a lot to help us, then I think you can take it for granted that we'll achieve democracy soon. But if you're not doing anything, then you have no right to expect us to achieve democracy quickly for you. Everybody must make his or her own contribution. Democracy is not just rights, it's responsibilities. And this, again, is at the basis of national reconciliation. Everybody must have, think of their own responsibilities as well as rights. I think we all have a responsibility to try to work out our differences peacefully and wisely. In our country, there has been no tradition of negotiated compromise. I have said this often, and I have said this sadly, that we do not have a tradition of negotiated compromise. It's either win or lose. This comes from years spent under authoritarian rule when the people were the losers and the rulers were the winners. It was never, there was never any question of who was on top and who was at the bottom. One of our, member, one of our elderly members used to say that there were four castes in Burma. The top caste was the military. Uh, the second were those who were uh, close to the military and who had acquired economic power. And the third, at, in those days, were the ceasefire groups who had come to an understanding with the military government. The fourth were the ordinary people. And he said, the NLD as a total outcast below all of those, because we, had, we enjoyed no rights whatsoever. We did not enjoy the rights of ordinary citizens. It was mentioned in the citation that uh, I was arrested in 2003 after the motorcade in which I was tra uh, traveling was attacked. We were the ones who were attacked and we were the ones who were imprisoned. Those who attacked us got away scot-free. We've never heard what happened to them. We've never heard whether or not any action was taken against them. We have never heard what was done to them. Not at all. But we, who lost some of our comrades, some of whom were, uh, four died, not too many. I, I like to be accurate about these things because I, it's irresponsible to make a situation appear worse than it was. Four died, many were wounded, and all of, almost all of us who were leading the motorcade were imprisoned. What kind of rule of law is this? What kind of justice is it that punishment is inflicted on those who have been wronged? And how can we build a nation on the basis of such values? These are the, some of the reasons why we came to understand how important rule of law was. And that is why we have also held to the great need for national, re national reconciliation. Whatever we achieve in our country, we have to achieve together. Very often when I'm traveling abroad, I'm asked about why I do not condemn the army for what it is doing in the Kachin state, or why I do not condemn Buddhists for attacking Muslims in the Rakhine state. I answer very simply, because I do not want to widen the divide already between the Kachins and the Burmese military, between the Muslims and the Buddhists in the Rakhine state. I have found that condemnation of one community increases fears and drives people to extremism. Everybody is afraid in a situation where violence breaks out all too often. I have said, and my party has stated officially, that the first step that has to be taken is to establish rule of law, that violence might stop. If people feel under threat, they cannot be expected to sit down to work out a solution to their differences. With regard to the Kachin state, the government is now conducting peace talks with the KIO, the Kachin Independence Organization. 
And I would like these peace talks to succeed. I would not wish to do anything that would jeopardize those talks. This is a time when we must give those who are involved in the peace negotiations to find success as best they can. By condemning one side or the other, we would only exacerbate, exacerbate the differences and encourage people to hold out for what they want without thinking of what they can give. National reconciliation has to be based on give and take, like a personal relationship. If one side takes too much, there will come a time when the other side will stop giving. But giving all the time is not the answer either. You also have to learn to take. Learn to take in the right way that the other side may understand that this is the basis of healthy relationship between human beings. This is the, relationship, the, uh, the basis of a healthy relationship between communities. As I read out at the beginning, there will never be an end to the process for rec uh, of na national reconciliation, as there will not be an end to the process of democratization. Democracy is a road, it's not uh, an absolute goal. In the same way, national reconciliation is a path, it's not an end. We have to walk the path of national reconciliation, supported by rule of law, that we may continue to strengthen the democratic roots of our society. The roots are not yet there. Now we think that the seedlings have been put in place. But seedlings can be swept away by a gust of wind. It can be, they can be kicked away by uh, an unheeding foot. Seedlings can be washed away by too much rain or dried up by very strong sun. So seedlings are not safe. We have to get to the point when these seedlings start to take root and the roots start to dig themselves into the ground. We have a long way to go before we get to that point. But we do want a chance to protect these seedlings from dangers and devastation. This is why we put such emphasis on amendments to the Constitution, on the rule of law, and on national reconciliation. These are the defenses against rough weather and against unkind, unkind actions against our very tender seedlings. The people of Australia enjoy the fruits of democracy. They are closer to both the East and the West than almost every other nation, uh, the peoples of every other nation, because there is no other country quite like Australia which is, which was, perhaps I should say worse, or should I say is, rooted in Western values and in Western traditions, and yet which is situated in the East, and increasingly more and more Eastern people are coming here and adding, enriching the diversity of your nation. Because you have tremendous advantages, I would like you to look to countries like ours, who are just starting out on the road that you take for granted. You think that democracy is there for you, that you're entitled to democracy. But entitlement is a perception. There is no such thing as absolute entitlement. We have to be deserving. And I would like my people to start out knowing that they have to deserve what they want to get. But at the same time, I would like you who have already got much more than we will, we have, we, than some of us could even dream of achieving in our lifetime, that we need your help and we need your support. We need your informed support, unless you know what our real needs are and what our real problems are, it would be difficult for you to give us 
the help that we need to proceed along the road that will truly make us part of this modern progressive world. Coming here to Australia, I, have, I am very privileged. Many of my peoples are settled here, but I'm here as a visitor. I'm privileged because I'm a visitor, because I have not been obliged to give up my country for various reasons. Many of our peoples are here not because they want to leave their country, but because they were forced to by circumstances. As a visitor who has been welcomed very warmly, I would like to thank you for all that you have done for us in the past and also to ask you to keep with us as we travel into the future, as we work for reconciliation and the rule of law, that our nation may be free and secure and may be able to make its own contribution to the betterment of the world. So as I thank you, I would like to request you to remain our true and good and informed friend. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Uh, Dorsu, on behalf of the members of the audience, on behalf of all of the Monash University community, I would like to thank you for your very constructive reflections on the role of reconciliation and equality under law in the achievement of a genuine democracy. Thank you again. And I would now like to call upon the university orator, Mr. Richard Buck, to moderate some questions from the audience. Thank you, Chancellor. We do have some time for questions and to get the questions flowing. The people in the following lucky seats, uh, if I mention your seat number and name, if you'd like to move to the aisles, to the standing microphones, David in L22, Frida in G34, Raymond in H15, and Dimity in P22. We'd ask all the questioners, if we have time, we'll move to some other questions to keep the questions straightforward and simple. In the introduction, also very brief, and if you could identify yourself by your name when you ask the question, is David. Thank you very much for telling us about your wonderful and long journey could I ask you whether there were times when you were despairing of a solution in the long term, uh, and where did you get your inner strength to continue the struggle? Well, I never despaired. Uh, I do have a very um, fertile imagination, but I never imagined that we would ever fail. So that is why I never despaired. And where did I get my strength from? Really, mostly from my colleagues, because they were going through a much a uh, more difficult time than I was. A lot of people speak about uh, my 15, 16 years of house arrest, but that's not nothing compared to imprisonment in Burma. Uh, if you have spent five years in prison in Burma, your health undergoes all kinds of problems that no normal person would be expected to undergo. So even from the simple physical point of view, they went through so much more than I did. And they had to worry about their families because a lot of them were the breadwinners of their families. And when they were put in prison, they had to worry about those who were left behind. And I would think to myself, if they can take it, why can't I? So they were my strength. Thank you. Frida? I can't see whoever it is who's asking me questions. <laughs> oh, okay. 
Uh, my name's Fried. I just finished my economics degree here at Monash. Um, I was just, you said um, that uh, we're so lucky to have our democracy. We are incredibly lucky to have functioning institutions. We enjoy unparalleled rule of law. Um, but it's true, as you said, we somehow, or often it seems that we lack this passion for democracy that the Burmese are, are fighting for at the moment. Um, uh, and although we do enjoy such a great democracy, there isn't a lack of inequality uh, and struggle in our country as well. Um, for example, the indigenous population um, and also some migrant communities that have been uh, often unjustly um, treated and are still struggling for inequality today. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts on how we might be able to overcome our lack of passion, um, especially among the young people of Australia and how we can overcome perhaps what is an apathy um, towards the political system. Well, I think we should put you under house arrest for a bit. And then you're <laughs> <don't> you? <laughs> Yeah, okay. But, uh, one of the reasons why I feel that the Australians can us is precisely because you have those problems with the indigenous people, the rights, and then the fact that you recognize that the problems are there. That's a, a beginning. And I think if the young people start recognizing the fact that perhaps they're not as passionate about politics as they ought to be, then they will start changing. But if you live in a place like Burma, where, as I said, you don't even question why you have been arrested. You get passionate in a very short time. <laughs> but don't forget what you have. You must learn to value what you have and come to visit us and come to know some of the young people. And then you, the young people of, us, of Australia, who don't think that it's a great deal to vote. Uh, let me tell you, I've never once voted in a free election in my life. I'm now 68. Now, learn to, learn to value your privileges. I couldn't, I was, uh, before Burma became, uh, came under military rule, I was too young to vote. And by the time I was uh, of age, there were no free elections. And then when there were, there were free elections in 1990, I was under house arrest. Uh, and then and last election, uh, last by-election, when I did contest the election as a candidate, uh, my, uh, where I was registered, there was no vacancies, so there, was no, there were no elections in, my co in the place where I was allowed to vote. So to this day, I have never once voted in a free election. So please, please value your right to vote and turn out to the next election and surprise your parents. Raymond. So I'm Raymond <coughs> Dinway from the, the Burmese community. Burma gained independence in 1948 with the full support of all major ethnic groups at the Panglong Conference to form the Union of Burma. This was achieved through the trust the people had placed in Bojo Aung San, who guaranteed equality before the law and a certain degree of autonomy to all major ethnic groups, including the Burman majority. The political crisis since 1962 were caused by the abrogation of this agreement and the betrayal of trust by the then dictator General Ne Win and the installation of fear of fed federalism into the people that it would lead to the disintegration of the union. As the most trusted political leader like Bojo Aung San, what is your vision of how national reconciliation be achieved so that uh, people can hope to live harmoniously in the Union of Burma. Would you call for a second Penglong conference? Or how else would you exercise the Penglong principles to achieve the goal? Thank you. I'd like to explain a little bit about Penglong. This is a place uh, where the conference is held. Now, uh, as uh, Dr. Dins said, the major ethnic groups signed it, but not all of them because they were, the Karens did not sign, the Rakhine were not then uh, considered um, a separate political force, if you like. So the Panglong Agreement was by no means perfect, but it was the spirit of Panglong that inspired us, because for the first time in the history of our nation, 
different ethnic nationalities had got together and agreed to work towards one particular political end, that was independence. And what, we decide, what was said in the Panglong Agreement was that those who, the signatories believed that independence would be achieved faster and better through cooperation, through agreeing to work together. So that is the importance of Panglong. There are some ethnic national, nationalities who understandably do not like so much emphasis on Panglong because they were not signatories to it. So it's not just, it's not who signed it, but why this came about. Trust, you mentioned trust. It was mutual trust. It was not just the ethnic leaders trusting my father. He trusted them too. It was mutual trust. So you said, how can we build up national reconciliation? National reconciliation, it, it may seem very naive, has to be built on honesty. Because without honesty, there can be no trust. I have of, often said to our party that we must never make easy promises to our people. We must not make the promises that we know we will not be able to keep. It is better that they should know that we have our weaknesses than to deceive them by pretending that we are totally strong. So honesty is the way about it. When we talk about a second panglong, we mean a meetings of the leaders of the different ethnic nationalities, including the Burmese, who are the major group, and working out a solution to the problems. But that can only be done if we trust one another. And let us, let us start by being honest with one another. We have tried to be honest. We, as I said earlier, we, uh, when, when I was asked to condemn the army or the, the Buddhists or condemn the Muslims or condemn one side or the other, I always said no, because I do not believe that condemnation will keep bring us closer. And that, of course, made me rather unpopular because people, when they are, people are asking for condemnation, they want condemnation. But we, I think we need to be honest. So I would like to say to all our ethnic nationalities, let us be honest with, with one another. Let us put our problems and fears and hopes frankly before each other, but at the same time, respecting each other's sensitivities and aspirations. Dimity. Thank you. Dr. Suchi, thank you for your words. I'm Dimity Pfeiffer from Australian Volunteers International. At AVI, we're lo working along with others in our sector with a very large constituency of people and organisations across Australia who wish to contribute their skills and experience to work alongside the Burmese people to address the great many challenges your country is facing. The emphasis in my question is on the how, as I ask, how can we in Australia best assist and support your country on its precious journey? First of all, you need to be aware of what is actually happening in our country. I have often found that people who are very, very eager to help us do not really know what our real needs and problems are. So you need to be more aware of what is happening. You need to be closer to us. I'm a great believer in engagement between young people because young people get to know one another so much quicker than older people do. But at the same time, the wisdom and experience of older people is something that is irreplaceable. So we need people across the board, old and young, getting to know Burma at different levels, not just as organizations, but as individuals as well. I have great admiration for many people in Australia who have specialized uh, on, on academic subjects linked to Burma. I, I'm a, I think I must say this, I don't know whether this is allowed or not to praise somebody from another university. But, <laughs> but I have great admiration for Dr. Sean Tunnell. He's done marvelous work on the Burmese economy. And he has helped us tremendously by providing us with many good ideas on how we can promote a healthy economy. So I would like you to be practical and to, as well as academic, thought and action must be linked to one another. And that way you would be able to help us think about what needs to be done and see if it can be done practically.
Chancellor, that concludes the time available for questions. Can I come go back to my seat? It's now my pleasure to call upon Professor of Medicine Paul Komisarov in his capacity as Director of Global Reconciliation to make a presentation. The Desmond Tutu Reconciliation Fellowship Award is named in honour of the Most Reverend Desmond Tutu, Anglican Archbishop Emeritus of Cape Town. It is the preeminent award for the recognition of accomplishments in the global field of reconciliation today. It provides a way of acknowledging and supporting people who have made outstanding contributions to dialogue and practical engagements aimed at enhancing understanding across cultural, racial, religious, political and other divides. The Tutu Award is administered by Global Reconciliation an international NGO based at Monash and RMIT universities. Global reconciliation promotes communication and dialogue in communities in the midst of and following conflict and presently is active in more than 40 countries around the world. Aung San Suu Kyi is one of the most eminent advocates for peace and reconciliation in the world today. She is universally respected and beloved as a great and inspiring figure and is seen as a symbol for the global struggle for human rights. Her political thought has been influential in many countries, especially in the developing world. Over more than two decades, she has remained at the forefront of the continuing battle for democratic freedoms in her country and has guided her people through a time of great pain and suffering. She has promoted reconciliation at all levels in Burma, including in relation to ethnic minorities and between the military regime and those who aspire towards democracy. She continues to draw on principles of restorative justice, as well as the need for all voices to be heard. She has also contributed to international movements for peace, reconciliation, and human rights. This includes her support for global reconciliation, of which she has been a patron since 2005. In relation to Australia, she and her organisation have facilitated a growing partnership of groups to support exchanges of many kinds with Burma in the fields of education, healthcare, law and culture. And many, representations, many representatives of this partnership are here today. The Desmond Tutu Award is made on the basis of a nomination and review process which considers the past accomplishments and demonstrated ability for future achievement of candidates in any walk of life. The decision to offer this award to Aung San Suu Kyi was made after consultation with a committee which included key representatives of the Burmese community in Australia and Australian supporters of democracy in Burma, including Professor Paul James, Dr Raymond Tintway, Mr Momong Tong, Dr Joseph Pereira, Saul Luin U and Mr Chris Lam. After considering her record of achievement, the committee was fully satisfied that Aung San Suu Kyi is unequivocally qualified to be a recipient of this prestigious award. The inscription chosen for the certificate reads, in recognition of outstanding work across communities in the struggle for greater understanding between cultures, civilizations, and political traditions, and in the healing of wounds created by social conflict. Do Aung San Suu Kyi, it is my great honour to bestow on you the Desmond Tutu Fellowship Award. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Dorsu. Ladies and gentlemen, the ceremony is now at an end. I invite you to remain standing at your seats as the procession leaves the hall. Thank you.